How does one correctly rule a state? This question was the main preoccupation of many thinkers during the Warring States period, a time of chaos but also great philosophies and new ways of conceptualizing the natural world and man's place within it. Many states were in perpetual war with one another and every state tried to do whatever they could to gain an advantage over the next, with an arms race of new technologies, weapons and resources and talented officials and generals. Something else, however, that was highly sought after were ideas of thinkers at the time, as warlords and kings understood its potency in helping them to structure their courts, become better at waging war and receiving the favor of heaven. And so this time was not only a period where blood and blows were exchanged, but also ideas. And since the political forces were the ones most interested in new ideas, it was only natural that a lot of the ideas that would become influential and survive to this day develop mainly as a tool of political and social function. You have philosophies such as Confucianism, Mohism, and the philosophy of Xuanzi, Taoism, and miscellaneous texts such as the Art of War, who all had their promise during this time but it was truly the legalists that thrived the most in the chaos. Their influence would contribute to an end of the Warring States period and frankly heavily influenced Chinese political thought until the present day. To explain legalism, I will be citing from the works of Han Fei and Shang Yang, who were the most influential legalist philosophers during the Warring States period. This video will also be structured into six parts. These will be virtue, morality in heaven, the state, the law, the ruler, the masses and how legalism was applied in the real world. To understand the position of the legalists, it would be helpful to understand how other popular schools of thoughts used the term virtue in their teachings. To the Mohists and the Confucianists, the perfect ruler, official, citizen, soldier, what have you, was one who had perfected virtuous conduct and thought. By performing rites and abiding by certain religious ideas and social structures, like respecting one's elders, you'd have a healthy society where people are good. So these thinkers promoted virtue as a way of shaping the ruler and his subjects. This the legalists strongly rejected. What is important to understand is that the thing that made the legalists stand out is their extremely pessimistic view of human beings. To them, humans are driven by selfishness and promise of fame and fortune. They are lazy, insolent, stupid, care only about their own affairs and not that of the state, which in turn heavily affects their collective well-being. People are simply too stupid to decide for themselves. The legalists essentially saw this as the way of the people and that a successful ruler would form laws and structure his court in such a way that was in tune with the natures of human beings. The ultimate goal, however, wasn't the freedom of the individual as it might be today. Being in tune with the nature of human beings didn't mean letting people do as they wish, but rather meant redirecting people to serve the state and the state only. Moreover, the legalists even viewed virtue as something harmful to society. Focusing on virtue meant studying history, classics, rituals, music, poetry and songs. To have a society in which its inhabitants spent their time pursuing these things is going to be harmful to it, since that means neglecting things that interested the legalists the most. Warfare, agriculture and efficient administration. To quote Shang Yang, if in a country there are the following 10 things, odes and history, rites and music, virtue and the cultivation thereof, benevolence and integrity, sophistry and intelligence, then the ruler has no one whom he can employ for defense and warfare. If a country is governed by the means of these 10 things, it will be dismembered as soon as an enemy approaches. And even if no enemy approaches, it will be poor. So the thing that made them stand out is how their pessimism of human nature made them disregard the thing that Confucians and Mohists value the most. Studying the classics and learning how to be virtuous, intelligent and so on. This would weaken the state and its strength to the legalists was really the only thing that mattered. It was through the state that society could be set up correctly. Before explaining the role that the state had in legalism, I'd like to share something Han Fei brings up regarding authority. In a passionate passage of his, he recognizes Confucius to be the greatest sage of his time. Uh, a little side note, yes, the legalists still respected Confucius as a great man, despite everything that I've said so far. His ruler, the Duke Ai of Lu, was very mediocre and not good at much of anything really, yet Confucius bowed to him, showing that virtue isn't what rules, only authority does. By bowing to Duke Ai, he recognized his authority over the state of Lu, and so 
What could be more important than the state as a political entity since that is what held the true power? That's right, absolutely nothing. In their eyes, the state was the highest political entity and there was nothing that could surpass it. The world is essentially divided into states that attempt to topple over one another. There was really no heaven above it to rule it. It's the state and it's finished at that point. Virtuous individuals who bless humanity through their knowledge of poetry and whatnot was nothing but a spook in this context. Due to the significance of the state, caring for its well-being is the single most important endeavor that anyone within it could undertake and was the only thing that concerned the legalists. A state cannot run on virtue even if utopian harmony was achieved, it would ultimately be useless if it couldn't defend itself or if its coffers were empty. The state should therefore focus all its energy on war, agriculture and administration. To achieve its goals, the state must employ various tactics and make sure that certain privileges lie in the hands of only a few, such as giving out rewards and punishments, employing the right people and making sure that they do what they're meant to do. To properly regulate this and make the state stable, it needed to focus not on virtue, but the bedrock of all practical applications of the legalist philosophy, the law. It has taken us a while, but we're now finally talking about quite possibly the most important aspect of legalist philosophy, laws and how to correctly form them. If the Confucians believed that the base of a healthy government was virtue because it could radiate over its subjects through correct application of the ruler, then that radiant shine would instead come from the law according to legalism. The main function of a state was essentially to draft laws and uphold them at every cost, and as long as this was the case, the state would remain strong. The law was such an important thing in legalism because it created several things. Firstly, it would create a universal standard on which to base everything on. If a person broke a law, they would be punished. If they perform what was set upon them, they would be rewarded. This might seem incredibly basic until you realize how muttered up this can get when you account for cringe things like ethics and virtue. This was something to be avoided at all costs, since virtue's behavior often went in odds with the law and so the standard had to be created from the law, not what sages thought was virtue's behavior. In the book of Han Fei, we find an example that illustrates this. In the state of Chu, there was a man named Honest Gong. When his father stole a sheep, he reported the theft to the authorities. But the local magistrate, considering that the man was honest in the service of his sovereign, but a villain to his own father, replied, put him to death. And the man was accordingly sentenced and executed. Thus we see that a man who is an honest subject of his sovereign may be an infamous son to his father. In the next paragraph, we get another example that flips the roles, but illustrates the same thing. There was a man of Lu who accompanied his sovereign to war. Three times he went into battle and three times he ran away. When Confucius asked him the reason, he replied, I have an aged father and if I should die, there will be no one to take care of him. Confucius, considering the man filial, recommended him and had him promoted to a post in the government. Thus we see that a man who is a filial son to his father may be a treacherous subject to his lord. Secondly, a focus on the law promoted meritocracy. The first aspect of this was that the law should be applied universally across all strata of society, which was quite audacious for the time and this got some legal philosophers in hot water to say the least. Also, it meant meritocracy in a conventional sense by applying a standard strictly. You would eventually weed out incompetent ones and end up with the most apt as your officials and generals. A very important relationship between the law and meritocracy, according to Han Fei, an idea that would come to have immense influence was that one should only perform duties that has been given to you. This he called names. Every minister had a name, which is really just to say a job description. If the actions don't match the name, then they are punished. If they do, they are rewarded. This is important because when people talk about meritocracy, they usually mean that you end up with the most competent people in terms of how great their achievements are. But to Han Fei, this can be problematic as well. If an official outperforms his duties and is rewarded for it, perhaps even more than previously agreed upon, this can create friction in court where an official can become ambitious, derailing the government in favor of one person. And so, if a person underperforms, they are punished for it. If a person delivers more than what is promised, they are also punished for it. Not because they did a bad job, but because the consequences of overstepping your bounds are greater than the benefit of the performance. Han Fei offers an example of this, which is perhaps one of his most famous passages. Once in the past, Marquis Zhao of Han got drunk and fell asleep. The keeper of the royal hat, seeing that the Marquis was cold, laid a robe over him. When the Marquis awoke, he was pleased and asked his attendants, Who covered me with a robe? The keeper of the hat, they replied. The Marquis thereupon punished both the keeper of the royal hat and the keeper of the royal robe. 
He punished the keeper of the robe for failing to do his duty and the keeper of the hat for overstepping his office. It was not that he did not dislike the cold, but he considered the trespass of one official upon the duties of another to be a greater danger than cold. In that quote, you also get an example of what Han Fei calls the two handles. These handles are rewards and punishments, and it was essential that the right to use them only lie with the ruler and nobody else. If a minister is allowed to hand out rewards and punishments, he can manipulate their image by appealing to the masses. This was also an essential part of legalist law. To keep things going, however, a ruler was needed. The law was his domain and his conduct in relation to the application of the law was just as important as its contents. So we must look to how legalism viewed the ruler. The ruler had to compose himself and exercise his power in a certain way in order for things to run smoothly. Shang Yang mainly speaks about the law being exercised with consistency and doesn't reflect much on the natural conflict that may arise between the ruler and his closest subjects, ministers, generals, and other officials. To Han Fei, the ruler and his closest subjects were naturally in conflict with one another and the ruler had to take precautions in order to limit the harm that this could bring upon the state. This leads us into a very interesting aspect of Han Fei's brand of legalism. He envisioned a ruler that was emotionless, mysterious, and shadowy to his ministers. This is because if the true nature of the ruler is known to subjects, they will attempt to appeal to that part of him. If the ruler is fond of sparing lives, ministers will appeal to his sense of kindness. If he is known to be cruel, they will appeal to his paranoia and anger. If the ruler values wisdom, his ministers will appeal to his virtue and love for knowledge by employing sophistry and empty words. If the ruler makes his nature known, his subjects will form themselves in camps, either in common hatred for him or because they together see weaknesses to exploit. If the ruler is blank, emotionless and only concerned with the law, then ministers will naturally apply all their energies to follow it and not gain an advantage in court for personal gain at least in theory. By doing this, the ruler will be following the ultimate way and the way Han Fei describes such a ruler can easily be mistaken for an immortal sage of Taoism. Do not let your power be seen. Be blank and emotionless. Government reaches to the four quarters, but its source is in the center. The sage holds to the source and the four quarters come to serve him. In emptiness he awaits them and they spontaneously do what is needed. When all within the four seas have been put in their proper places, he sits in darkness to observe the light. When those to his left and right have taken their places, he opens the gate to face the world. He changes nothing, alters nothing, but acts with the two handles of reward and punishment. Acts and never ceases. This is what is called walking the path of principle. The ruler doesn't tell people what to do. It's all laid down clearly in the law and assignment of duties. The ruler doesn't speak first and isn't hasty in questioning his officials. He lets them speak first and compares what they say with what they do. The ruler never upholds one of his subjects to the point where they can afford to question his authority, but makes sure that rewards are appropriate to a position. If somebody gets too large, he will seek to undermine that person or family. The ruler should isolate himself and not let anyone even know about his passions. He should be empty, guided by the law that has been set up. Below him are not only ministers and generals, but the common man is affected by his rule. The ruler rules the masses. Something that the legalists hated were people who made a living doing easy things. This included scholars who dedicated themselves to intellectual endeavors, artisans, merchants and the like. They wanted to make it difficult for people to move around since that made merchants rich. They wanted to make the pursuit of a cushy job as an official difficult as this would dissuade people from studying too much. While they didn't necessarily comment on the skill required to perform these jobs, it was nothing compared to toiling away at a farm or risking your life at the battlefield. But these were actually the things that made a state strong. They were understanding of people's drive to fulfill their own desires in the easiest way possible, but also saw this as a detriment to the state. And so the wishes of the people and the state were at odds with one another. Instead, the natural inclinations of human beings should be redirected to serve the state. By making farming profitable, for example, people will stick to farming. By keeping people stupid and in awe of the state, they will abandon the classics. By forbidding people from moving freely, merchants will not be able to leech on the works of others. The legalists harshly call people who devote themselves to such enterprises uh, vermin and parasites, so that may give you a clue of how they view the masses. The masses were very much affected by the application of legalism and so a brief overview of how legalism was applied in the real world is in order. 
Shangyang was one of the first seriously influential propagators of a legalist system as he gained a lot of influence in the state of Qing, who was, as we all know, the victorious state in the Warring States period. Through his guidance and groundwork that he laid, Qin would turn itself from an impoverished backwater to the militarily and economically supreme state of the Chinese region. Legalism has in retrospect become known as a very cruel philosophy of rule, oppressive to the people and barbaric. The harsh nature of legalism is hard to deny, especially looking at various policies that were enacted directly through legalist thought. Shangyang would, for example, infamously promote systems where families were put in strict groups wherein they all had a duty to report the failures of another. If this was not followed, then the entire family unit would face severe punishment. He also created the Nine Familial Executions, an incredibly harsh punishment where a person deemed to have committed crimes such as treason would have their entire lineage exterminated and then executed themselves by having chariots pull one's four limbs apart from the torso and be left to bleed out. Ironically, Shangyang will be executed in this exact way. Legalism went on to form the basis of rule in the state of Qin until its downfall to the Han, who then inherited a system that remained mostly unchanged, but now Confucianism was heavily promoted over legalism. Confucian scholars were now in the upper echelon of rule in the Han dynasty with a grudge against the legalists for incidents in the past in tandem with the Qing conquests. According to the Confucians themselves, Confucian scholars had been buried alive by the rulers of Qin. I frame it in this way because the only ones to have ever recorded this incident were, well, Confucians. No matter what is really true or not, there was an ideological conflict between the two and Confucian scholars would often attribute the fall of the Qin to the perceived brutal treatment of the people through policies devised by the legalists. However, the Han state inherited its strong centralization and expanded on efforts by the Qin to centralize language, for example, into a common script, today called Hanzi, or as we know it, the Chinese script. Essentially, the Han would inherit many things that made the Qin so mighty, and this idea of centralization in favor of a feudal system of dividing the land would remain throughout Chinese history all the way until the Qing dynasty a mere 110 years ago. These ideas have not died out though, and the modern Chinese state is one that very much values a strong central government. Learning more about this school of philosophy is essential to understanding the DNA of Chinese political thought, both historically and in a modern context. It can be seen as a Chinese equivalent of Realpolitik and the writings of Machiavelli. These comparisons are, however, lazy at best and doesn't capture the full range of topics that legalist philosophers cover and so legalism is best studied on its own. It's a tradition that has had such a profound impact on the trajectory that history has taken thus far, especially in its opposition to feudalistic ways of ruling, which is something that has truly stuck. In this video, I have attempted to be as comprehensive as I possibly can, but there is so much that I have not covered, as the likes of uh, Li Si, Li Kui, and uh, Shen Bu Hai, um, some of the most infamous and influential legalist philosophers. And so I recommend you to continue exploring this topic on your own. In the description below, I'll be linking various sources that will be of help if you wish to delve into the topic yourself. At the very least, I'd highly recommend Han Fei, who is quite an entertaining read. But at the end of it all, I hope you'll have a nice day and stick around for more content in the future.